Okay, good morning. I'm excited to talk a little while about crop rotation. I appreciate the opportunity. I just think it's such an essential component of a successful organic system. Um, the Standard Process Farm is in the southeast corner of Wisconsin. We have about 420 acres here in a block. And we also have 175 acres at home. So if I don't get quite enough farming all day, we get to go home and be organic farmers at night too. So we have about 600 acres that we're using crop rotation on. Um, here at Standard Process, we grow all of these um, beautiful crops and everything is kept here. We um, process it here and bottle it here. So everything is kept on the farm. Um, we use it for these whole food supplements. This year we're going to grow 34 um, separate crops. That obviously gives us just tons of opportunity for crop rotation. We don't put the same crop or the same crop family on the same soil for at least five years here. So obviously 34 crops gives us a great chance um, to spread out our crop rotation as far as we can. Obviously when you're a certified organic farm, crop rotation is part of the NOP and part of the laws we have to live by. I just think it's so essential for soil health and the fact that we can't use synthetics this will be the 14th year that I've managed all these vegetables at Standard Process and um, knock on wood, our crop rotation I believe is the reason. We have never lost a crop to disease. I don't even have a crop disease picture to show anybody because we've never lost a crop. But I also think crop rotation is essential for us for insect control without synthetics. I wanted to mention just briefly too that um, we incorporate trap crops into our crop rotation. I think that they're really cool. We grow five to ten acres of cucurbits every year and for those of you guys trying to grow pumpkins and squash, you know, cucumber beetle are tough and squash bug. But they really strongly prefer these Hubbard squash. Um, so we make them part of our rotation and I love trap crops too because they're so easy on beneficials. So we just make sure to make trap crops part of our crop rotation. Uh, we, like I said, we plant, we manage, we harvest, and we process all of these crops. There's only eight of us here. So uh, crop rotation, I think, is just awesome, too, as far as spreading out the workload, especially at home. When I'm not home all day, it's nice to have uh, winter wheat and alfalfa. So everything doesn't have to be done the same week. We have an absolutely beautiful soil here. We have between 3 and 40% organic matter. And the organic matter and the cation exchange capacities of this soil have actually gradually increased since they've been under our organic management. And it just wouldn't be possible without crop rotation, especially crop rotation with cover crops. Hmm. There we go. Um, this is very typically what we do as far as fertility is concerned. We'll try to, oops, see, I went too far. Got to be more patient. We'll try to grow a cover crop, um, you know, that creates nitrogen before a cover, or be not a cover crop, I apologize. We try to grow a crop that creates nitrogen before a crop that needs it. And I took this picture last year of our soybean nodules. I think these are just exceptional nodules um, in a row crop situation. I think this is possible because the diversity of cover just makes this excellent um, soil life that makes nodulation possible. But down to weed control because that's what we're supposed to be talking about today. And so this is a very typical five-year rotation at Standard Process, very, very typical of what we might do. We start with a very heavy forage crop. Uh, like this alfalfa, we also grow quite a bit of buckwheat. But when we can grow this really dense forage crop, we basically come out of the crop with no weed pressure, which is perfect for a crop that we typically transplant like our crucifers. You could see this field of Brussels sprouts. We need a very clean seed bed um, to transplant successfully. And we have this wonderful weeder, it's called a Reggie weeder. But in fields that we transplant, I could keep this field very clean, you could see, in between the Brussels sprouts. We're going to come out of these Brussels sprouts with a pretty clean, weed-free soil. And then I go to something that to me is almost impossible, like a carrot. And 
we have to start with a soil that we know doesn't have heavy weed pressure from the last two years. If a care comes up slow, it doesn't really ever canopy. Um, so typically when we come out of carrots, we probably have um, pretty weedy fields sometimes. We'll go to something with a really dense, nice canopy like a kidney bean or a sweet pea. And then we'll go into a crop that we can't really weed in the fall because of the vines. Um, I thought that was very interesting when Tammy talked about um, mulching her vines. We have not typically done that, but with this rotation, we can grow some very nice um, cucurbits in the fall if we keep this rotation in mind. But I think I'm going to try the mulch. I like that. So situations where we have very he heavy annual weeds, our worst weeds are lamb's quarter and pigweed. Every year, my organic inspector says, Christine, you're in good shape. Those are high fertility weeds, but that doesn't make anybody feel better that has them. <laughs> so when I come out of a situation like carrots where I know there might be a, a seed bank, I will not rotate uh, to a vegetable that's never going to canopy for me. This is Swiss chard. You could see in this field, um, to another good example, here's a velvet leaf, a velvet, there's like four velvet leaves coming in this field, five. Um, we will walk that field and pull the velvet leaf when it gets taller, which is nice about a row crop. We have some giant ragweed here. Giant ragweed can really become an issue very quickly um, in this part of the country. We have some very nice organic neighbors who've had to give up fields um, because the giant ragweed pressure was just so heavy. So we are very, very uh, diligent about keeping the ragweed off this farm. We will not, if there's a spot where a few ragweed have come in, um, plant a crop that's drilled because we want to be able to get to this ragweed and pull it. We um, learned at the organic conference, rag, giant ragweed has about the shortest um, lifespan in the soil. The seed doesn't last that long. And so we really have pretty much been able to eliminate ragweed on this farm totally by pulling it. I do think birds and such drop it here and there. It blows in from our neighbors. But if um, we have a spot where we think the ragweed might come, we avoid something that's drilled, especially cereal green. For me personally, the toughest weed that we battle, especially in these vegetables, is thistle. Um, it seems to come in from our um, fence rows. I do believe there's been situations where we've inherited some thistle seed with our vegetable seed that we purchased. I um, stole this picture from the internet. We do not have any red clay here, but I thought this was a great picture of sorghum Sudan class grass. Um, we went to some classes specifically to try to learn how to manage thistle control. And since most of our thistle is on the edges, um, especially sometimes where we have long-term buffer, you know, strips of grass, we've had a lot of success um, with sorghum Sudan grass. So we plant it where the thistle is the thickest, we let it get about six feet tall, and we mow it, which for us is about July. Then we let it get six or seven feet tall again, and we do not cut it. We rotivate it straight in. So it's been beautiful, obviously, huge amount of biomass um, back into our soil. And it does seem to really be keeping these thistles in check. Obviously, you're giving up income for the season um, where you try this strategy. And so we do just kind of limit it um, to strips on the outside of our fields. Another strategy that we have tried um, only for thistle is um, very targeted areas of fallow. So this farm is very flat. It's 0 to 3% slope. And this area of the state is prone to wind erosion. So um, we are very careful when we use this strategy and uh, only use it within fields that already have cover. So say if we have a field of kidney beans or something, we'll drive into the circular place where the thistle is spreading. And in the 
the very heat of the summer, so late July or early August for us, we, in these very small areas, mold bore plow and bring the roots of the thistle up. Um, this has worked for us in the past. Um, I'd say slow down 80% of the thistle. I'm hoping that the Sorghum Sudan system has a lot of success um, because I just, um, fallow scares me with our wind, but it, it has worked for us in very limited situations. I love this um, option where we have winter annuals. We come in in the fall and we plant very um, either oats or barley seeded with crimson clover. Crimson clover is a biennial. The winter kills uh, our grass cover and leaves us this beautiful mat that's going to be an awesome carbon source. The crimson clover tends to come in very heavy underneath it and choke out our winter annuals. There are also very few spots on our farm um, where we have a lighter sand soil and we try to do this in the fall. It's also excellent for early spring wind erosion control of our, for our soil. But I really like this um, oats or barley with crimson clover interceded. We go about um, six pounds of clover and a bushel and a half of oats or a bushel and a quarter of barley. For the most part, we um, have the luxury of these shorter season vegetables. And so cover crops are very much a reason we've been able to keep weed pressure under control on this farm. If we have an early season vegetable like a sweet pea, we will plant cover crop immediately after. If we have a late season crop like fall radish, we plant cover crop all spring and summer. So we have this wonderful cover crop that is very, very dense, you can see. Um, I love cover crop cocktails. I think diversity in cover for us has been as important as diversity in rotation. Um, I threw this picture in. This is a very typical of example of what we'll do. This is um, chickling vetch. I don't um, like hairy vetch. I don't grow it anymore because hairy vetch to me too easily becomes a weed. Um, but we use a lot of chickling vetch, um, buckwheat, and barley. And I think the neat thing about this slide is these are all things that we were able to combine here. So sometimes these cover crop Cocktails, too, are things that we combined here and that really stretches our cover crop budget. Um, but obviously, the barley and the buckwheat and the chickling vetch will all be doing different things for our soil health, and um, the vetch grows quite a bit of nitrogen. I think um, cover crops in our rotation, we pretty much every acre of this farm every year will have a cover crop somehow. But very important, we have a very clean, for the most part, organic farm, weed-wise. I think it's because these cover crops are so dense, but also just wonderful fertility because of this diversity in rotation. For the crops that have a state average, like um, soybeans, corn, wheat, oats, barley, um, we beat the state conventional average every year. You know, most of the crops we're growing like uh, Spanish radish don't have a state average, but I do think that crop rotation has our weeds in check to the point where it, it makes us um, very competitive. And this is my last slide. Um, I just think this sums up perfect why we do crop rotation. You could see the aggregation of this soil and the tilth, um, the organic matter at different stages remaining. These are uh, red beets that I planted last summer, took the picture. So I really appreciate the chance um, to have visited with you today.